that in the beginning, when you made all things, you said they were good, and that includes each and every one of us. And for that, we give you thanks for the goodness of this day and the goodness of each of your children who you have gathered here. We give you thanks for the beauty of the story of Easter and the hope of the resurrection. We ask that as we gather, that we feel your spirit dancing among us and living once again within us, that we may be your resurrection, your resurrected people, a people who bring your hope to life and make your love real in the now of our action. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Easter and Christ is risen. Amen. I know we have lots of new people here today, and so um, if you're a first-time visitor to the congregation, our ushers have a small gift for you, as well as a little bit of information. So just please raise your hand so that we can welcome you um, into our community and say thank you for being here with us today. As, as the ushers pass that around, I would also like to uh, let people know that we've got a number of um, amazing things that are happening today uh, in and right after worship. And so in case I forget, which is my habit later on in the worship, I get carried away. <laughs> Our children's ministry has reminded us, for all of those children who are here and all the parents who have gathered, us, um, gathered with us today, um, that there is going to be an Easter egg hunt immediately following our closing song. Um, if you just head out into the courtyard, which is through the door over here to your left, um, into the courtyard, um, our children's ministry will then guide you, and all of the children are welcome to participate in that um, Easter egg hunt. So we do encourage you to um, hang around and do that as well. Um, I will try to repeat that later on, but I at least made sure that I, I got it in. 
Um, a special welcome to everybody who is joining us online from around the world. Thank you for tuning in. It is always a joy and a blessing to know that as we worship here in this incredible space, that we are also connected through the miracle of modern technology to people literally around the world. It is a joy and a blessing. Um, we thank you for checking in and sharing some of your thoughts about worship. We do encourage you to scroll down at some point during the worship on the window where you're watching this, this broadcast, and you'll find that there's a place where you can enter in your name, your prayers. Let us know how we can continue to support you spiritually wherever you are on your life journey or literally where you may be around the world. Happy Easter. I now do invite everybody to rise as you're able to greet those who are near you and let people know that Christ is risen and they are in the right place. And for the rap challenged, let me translate. <laughs> Our first reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been rolled away. So she ran off to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and told them, the rabbi has been taken from the tomb. We don't know where they have put Jesus. At that, Peter and the other disciples started out toward the tomb. They were running side by side, but then the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He didn't enter, but bent down to peer in and saw the linen wrappings lying on the ground. Then Simon Peter arrived and entered the tomb. He observed the linen wrappings on the ground and saw the piece of cloth that had covered Jesus' head lying not with the wrappings, but rolled up in a place by himself. Then the disciple who had arrived first at the tomb went in. He saw and believed. As yet, they didn't understand the scripture that Jesus was to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes.
Meanwhile, Mary stood weeping beside the tomb. Even as she wept, she stooped to peer inside, and there she saw two angels in dazzling robes. One was seated at the head and the other at the foot of the place where Jesus' body had lain. They asked her, Why are you weeping? She answered them, Because they have taken away my rabbi, and I don't know where they have put the body. No sooner had she said this than she turned around and caught sight of Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. He asked her, Why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? She supposed it was the gardener, so she said, Please, if you're the one who carried Jesus away, tell me where you've laid the body and I will take it away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus then said, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to Abba God. Rather, go to the sisters and brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Abba and to your Abba, my God and your God. Hear what the Spirit says today. Christ is risen. You know, for me, if, if, if we go back to the words uh, that we just sang, that, that hymn that we just had, that little, that little phrase, you know, that's the vision of what resurrection is supposed to look like. Great is the morning, we all remember. God is far greater than any tomb. No matter where you are in your journey, no matter how overturned or upside down your life may feel, no matter what dead ends or walls you may face that you're up against. Our God is greater than all of that. Bigger than fear, greater than death. God is the God of love. We are told in the very beginning, the opening chapters of this story, this faith story, that God is the God of love who creates for no other reason than for love, who creates out of relationship and in love who creates and calls everything good, creates you, creates I, everything that is, was, or ever will exist. No matter where you are on your journey, no matter what you feel like or what people have said about you, God is the God of love and loves each and every one of us for who we are. That's an amazing story. That is a story of hope that is more powerful than any fear or any hurt or any anger or any dead end that we may pick up on life's journey. That's our story. It's the story to hold on to, to know that when you're in that desert place or that valley wandering, when the night seems lost and dark and lonely, God is there with you. That's the beginning of the hope that is the resurrection. But the story doesn't end there. It goes on. Tears turn to gladness. Fears turn to joy. Hope fills our hearts as hope fills the world. And I'm like, okay, but, but where's that happening? Because I don't know about you, but, 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 but if you're paying attention, it doesn't feel like that's the kind of world that we're living into. Like, where is that resurrected hope? Where is that love? Where are the tears wiped away? Where is it that death no longer has power? We live somewhere between the resurrection that we celebrate of Jesus and the resurrection of yet to come. But it doesn't mean that we wait without power or without hope. It doesn't mean that we wait passively for resurrection to just kind of catch up and happen. We wait with the promise that God is with us on the journey 
that we are the people who are the body who is Christ. And if Christ has been resurrected, then we need to be resurrected indeed. If Christ is resurrected, then the hope of God's love, the place where fear is set aside and love is made real, happens in us and through us when two or more of us are gathered with that hope. This is the Easter story. This is the promise. But the whole point about the story is it's not the question of what do we make of this story, this incredible story. The point is what we make of the story. How do we hear and listen to these stories and these words in ways that that kind of love and that resurrected hope is real for us today, is real for the stranger who wanders the world today? That's the power of this story and the power of the resurrection. So let's go back. Let's go back to the story. I think that it's really important because I think just like the beautiful Christmas story that we explored about four months ago, the character of the story and the characters in the story tell us a whole lot about this God whose love is resurrected within us and through us, who offers this hope of us being resurrected, not just at some future time, but that love will be resurrected in moments that we glimpse love made real. So the story begins. It begins before the sun is up. We are told that Mary and some of her friends, some of the women, they are the first to rise. And they rise in order to prepare the body that had to be put into the tomb late on Friday evening. And so they gather up what they need and their whole focus is to take care and nurture that body, to honor the body. And so they rise up and they head off. They don't know as they wander. There's this big stone that has been put in front of the tomb and they know that it's gonna be a hindrance and they don't know how that hindrance is gonna be moved away. They talk amongst themselves. Who will roll away the stone, they ask, and yet, that does not hold them back. Their hope is so powerful that they head out on the journey not knowing how that hurdle will be overcome. Is this not a story for the hope that we should have within our own lives? We all face hurdles. And so they arrive, and to their amazement, the stone has been rolled away. In the darkness of night, the stone has been rolled away. Even as we are sleeping, God is at work moving away those hindrances and those roadblocks so that we can be freed to be love and hope made real once more. And so they get there, and they're surprised, and Mary peeks into the tomb, and then she runs back. She runs back to share with the other disciples what it is that she has seen. Jesus is not there. The body is not there. I think that this is an important message. We will not find the love of the living God, the hope of the Holy Spirit, the power of Jesus who is the Christ. We will not find that in any of our dead end places, empty ways, roadblocks, the holes we dig for ourselves, the places where we just kind of get comfortable and settle on in. God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. God is not contained in those tombs. God is somewhere out here among us in the living. And so Mary goes and she tells the disciples what she has seen. The tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. And the disciples partly because of just the time in which they live, but it's not too different than today. They receive this testimony from two women and they can't quite trust it. And so a couple of guys have to go and check it out. <laughs> and, and they do, and they do what we so often do, right? It's just this amazing little story where all of a sudden you got two disciples who are doing what? They are racing as earnestly as they can, so focused on being the first one to get where? to the tomb. <laughs> like, isn't that the story of how we sometimes spend our lives? We spend our lives so focused on whatever it is that we're focused on, so focused on the competition with somebody else that we don't realize that the place it's all leading is not to a fuller life, 
but to a bigger hole in which for us to lay down and die. But that's not the end of the story. That's where hope lies. And so they get to the, the tomb. We're told that, that the disciple that Jesus loved gets there first, and he arrives, and so now he has bragging rights because he got there first. And he gets there, but, but he doesn't go in. It's like dark, and I, I imagine that the first rays of, of sunlight are, are like starting to illuminate the first few feet so you can kind of see beyond the entrance. And he's there, and he peers around the corner, but he's not quite sure what to do next. And so he waits for the other one to venture in before him. And so Simon Peter arrives, and he heads in, and what they find is this empty tomb with some linen all nice folded up and set aside there in a couple of spots. And then they run away. And then they run away. We don't catch up with the group of disciples, the 11 remaining disciples. We don't catch up with them again until we find them where? We find them in a locked room behind a door with the shades closed, hiding out, afraid, afraid for their own safety. This is what happens, I believe, when we don't understand the fullness of this story, the story of love and the story of hope. When we want to stop the story somewhere in the middle, when we are unwilling to face all the things in our life that we need to let die in order for resurrection to truly come forward, whether we are there in the physical tomb or locked behind some doors hiding out for our own safety, we're dead to life nonetheless. The story of the message of hope, the story of the message of the resurrection is the story of the message that fear should not have that kind of power over us anymore because God is with us wherever we are on the journey. And so it's like these big, buff, bold disciples go and run away and hide in the upper room. And it's frail little Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary who, who, who throughout history has been painted in a negative light. She's the one who some say are a woman of a night. She's the one who some say was making a living with survival sex before we actually knew that that was even a term or a sad necessity in a society that doesn't have compassion for people who don't quite fit in. But it's Mary who has the courage not just to peek beyond or to run away, but to go deep within and to face down all of that emptiness that that fear and that death will have no power anymore. And she's surprised by two angels who happen to be there. And she's like, yo, hey, what you do with my Jesus? <laughs> and they're like, yo, he's not here. Whatever traditions that we've grown up in, we've inherited all kinds of stories, all kinds of images, all kinds of things that we believe the church is supposed to look like and Jesus is supposed to look like and what all these things are supposed to be. And the reality of the power of this story is that God is always the God of surprises and it doesn't look like any of those things that we've been led to believe or taught because God is bigger than we could ever hope for or imagine. It ain't there. It ain't there. And so she backs up and she turns and she turns away from all of that emptiness. She turns away from the empty space of that dead tomb. She turns away from the dead ends. And she sees Jesus. Now for me, if this is not a testament of what leaders really need to look like, I don't know what is. What does it say to us that when she turns away, the risen Jesus is mistaken for a helper? What does it say to us about what leadership needs to look like when the risen Jesus can be mistaken for a helper?
And so she turns. What have you done? Where has he gone? And he says, Mary. Mary. A single word, just her name. And she instantly sees beyond whatever it is that has been clouding her eyes. Resurrection doesn't look like mere resuscitation. In resurrection, the body is fundamentally reorganized. All of those dead bits are gone away. All of the broken bits are gone away. All of the fear, the death, the disease, the bad memories that we've carried around with us that have held us back, has, has held us back, all of that stuff goes away. The resurrected body is renewed, refreshed, reorganized. It's sort of like going from caterpillar to butterfly. It's a one-way direction, and it fundamentally looks different than you could ever hope for or imagine. But yet, the heart of Jesus, the heart of Christ, still lives and still thrives. And in just that one word, Mary, she hears and feels the heart of compassion that she knows that this is the love of Christ. What would it be like if strangers in our world, no matter where they've been on their journey, people who are carrying around all kinds of baggage and all kind of hurt, that they could hear the love of God touching them when we call their name? What would it be like in this world if God's love were that real? That's where hope lives, where fear dissipates, where tears no longer have their powers, and where love becomes real in the now of our action. That's what resurrection, my friends, is all about. And so he says, he says for me, the most profound and prophetic thing, Mary, let go. Let go. Let go of me. Don't cling to me. Let go. Go. Let go of all the things that we're holding on to for safety and security. Let go of all of the boulders that we're holding on because it's easier to hide behind them than it is to come out of the shadows. Let go of all of those things that we are holding against ourselves and against others in order that the resurrected Christ may live and thrive. This is the story of the resurrection. It's not what we make, it's not how we make of, it's not what do we make of the story. It is what we make of the story that matters. So, you know, when I was the pastor in San Antonio, there was a fellow who came to church and he'd come like once every couple of months initially and he sat in the back and he'd slip in after we began and slip out after we left. And then eventually he started coming a little more frequently and started sitting a little bit closer and then we finally ended up having coffee and we sat down and we had a conversation. And it turned out that he was a pastor in a very conservative fundamental denomination and that he was struggling because for a long time he knew the truth about his own sexual orientation and that just didn't, didn't fit with that particular faith that he was trying to be a pastor of. And it was a real internal hurt and a real internal struggle. And we sat and we had long conversations. And finally, on one day, I remember this so distinctly, we sat down and he said, you know, with tears coming down his eyes, he said, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Kevin, he's like, like, I totally get that God is love. I totally get that God loves me for who I am. I totally get that I can't change. This isn't a choice because believe me, I've tried and I've changed and it just ain't happening. He said, but here's the thing. I can't get beyond the cross. I can't get beyond Jesus died. And I said to him, I said, you know, but here's the thing, John. The story doesn't end there. God is the God of love. God is the God of hope. God is the God of life. The story continues from Good Friday on to Easter morn. It is the story about the stone that has been rolled away, about Jesus who's been resurrected, about Christ who lives on in us and through us once more. What we make of this story so incredibly matters. When I was doing my time of residency as a hospital chaplain, I was paged one Sunday afternoon to the bedside of a 94-year-old woman who was lying there facing surgery on Monday morning early, and she was scared to death. What's the problem, I said. She said, I got surgery in the morning. I said, I know. And she said, well, here's the thing. I've been going to church every single Sunday since I was like six years old. 
I said, wow, okay. She says, but here's the thing. For the last three years, I, I, I've been frail and I've lived in a nursing home and I haven't been able to go. And she said, because of that, I think that I'm going to die on that table and then I'm going to suffer in hell. And I said, but wait a minute. I said, you will find in the letter of John that God is the God of love. Would that, is that what the God of love would do? She said to me, no one has ever shared that with her. No one had ever shared that with her. Go into church since she was six years old every single Sunday for nearly 91 years. How do we not know that God is the God of love? How do we not know that that's what the power of this story and the resurrection really is all about? How do we not know that that's what Easter is all about? We need to share and tell this story because when we do, that's how resurrection is made real. That is how resurrection lives on. That is how we become Christ in the present, resurrected to be love made real for others. Resurrection is real. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I believe that some future point, who knows when, resurrection will happen to all and to everything when creation is made new. But I also believe that we live in the here and now, and if this story matters, it matters because of what we make of it. You are the resurrection. You are the hope, and you have the power within you to make God's love and hope real once more. My friends, Christ is risen. May Christ be risen in our deeds. seated. At this time, I now invite the Nestor, Mark, uh, Mark and Nestor um, Bennett and their family and friends, the godparents, to come on down. Easter is a special time. It's a time when we celebrate renewal and rebirth, and something that makes it really, really special is when we also have the privilege and the honor to baptize individuals in the name of this one who is risen on this day. And so I met briefly with Mark and Nestor and with their children last week, and we talked a little bit about what their hopes were, and they said, you know, they've been on this journey, and they were looking for a, a family of faith and a community that they could raise their children in, one which was progressive, one in which they could teach them the core values. They looked around, and they want to be a bigger part of this church family, of Founders Metropolitan Community Church. And so today we are blessed and we are honored. We, we have with us today um, Mark and, and Nestor. 
um, as well as godparents, Elizabeth and Tal Lewis. Um, they're the godparents for Landon. And then we also have um, Sharon and Darren Haylock, and they are the godparents for Parker. Where's Park? Parker's here. Um, and then we also have um, Bessie Bennett and Kevin Hakewissel. Hakewissel. Um, and they are, they are going to be the godparents for um, Josephine, who we can all figure out who Josephine is. <laughs> I said, my goodness, she's ready to go to the prom. <laughs> so I thank you all. So I have a few questions for you. Um, we, we celebrate a tradition where um, we baptize infants, we baptize children, we also baptize adults. Um, we recognize that when we baptize children, we baptize children based on the promises and the commitments of the family and, and of the godparents. And we do that because we understand that it is a powerful moment in your life journey as a family, and also because the commitments that we're going to um, baptize them on is the commitment that you will raise them in ways that they will honor this God of love who we worship. And so the questions are very simple. The first is this. Do you promise to the best of your ability to raise your children, to protect them, to keep them safe, and to honor them in all the ways that are in keeping with the teachings of Jesus in this God who is love? We do. And do you believe in the God of love who is the creator of all that is, was, and ever shall be? Yes. Do you believe in Jesus who is the Christ, the one who is risen, who we celebrate today? And do you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that makes us one? Absolutely. And let me bless the water, and then we're going to baptize you. So, Heavenly Creator, we give you thanks. We remember that it is in the water that you renew us. That it was in the water in the beginning of creation that you called out and made a place, space that love could thrive. It was through the waters that you led your people of Israel out of oppression and through the wilderness and on into the promised land. It is through the water that we remember that it was John who prepared the way for Jesus, who called us to repent of all those things that get in the way that we may be love made real and renewed. And so, Heavenly Creator, we ask that you bless this water, that you bless this water, that in the water we may wash away all the things that were carried with us from the past, that in the water we may feel your life thriving in us and through us, a life renewed. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to start with Parker, since Parker, you're here. Parker... I baptize you in the name of the Creator and in the name of the Christ and in the name of the Holy Spirit that makes us one. Amen. Josephine, I baptize you in the name of the Creator, in the name of the Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit that makes us one. <laughs> Landon. <laughs> Landon, I baptize you now in the name of the Creator, in the name of the Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit that makes us one. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Creator, May you bless this family on its journey. May you bless each and every one of us that as we continue to celebrate the resurrection and we celebrate the baptisms of these children, that we remember that we are one because of the Holy Spirit that gathers us together, that in this day that we do take responsibility for one another on this journey. May we continue to provide a safe space for those who need healing, an encouragement for those who are ready to move out to serve the world. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. Please, please be seated. You believe in the resurrection? Because it sure feels real to me. <laughs> Praise God. For all those who are joining us online, it is always a joy and a blessing to know that you are there. At this time, we do invite you to go and gather up the bread, the crackers, the juice, whatever it is that you would like to use for communion, because in a few minutes, we're going to be celebrating communion. And communi communion, the way that we celebrate it here at Founders Metropolitan Community Church, it is an open communion. It means everybody is able to participate, literally, wherever you are, not just on your life journey, but by gathering up the elements now, you'll be able to participate it wherever you physically are around the world today as well. For everybody who is here, I do encourage you to take your worship bulletin. It does double as your newsletter. Lots of things that are happening. In two weeks, we are having our annual congregational meeting. And what that means is that first, um, we're going to have one combined worship service, and that's going to be at 10 a.m. So on April 30th, one worship service, all church worship, that is going to be at 10 a.m. And then around noontime, we're going to be having our annual, uh, our spring congregational meeting. And during that congregational meeting, we're going to be electing board members, electing um, individuals to an open seat on the pastoral search team. We are going to be doing some bylaw changes, and we'll be giving you some updates about um, what's happening with the finances and other ministries within the life of the congregation. A couple of important things. Today is the last day to get your applications in if you're considering running for the board um, or standing for the pastoral search team. And so if you haven't done so already, um, please get those applications to me by the end of the day. Um, we need those in so that we can get them published to the congregation and as well as translated into Spanish um, or if they're in Spanish, translated into English so everybody in the congregation can benefit um, when it comes time for us to get to the April 30th meeting. Between now and April 30th, we have published um, the bylaw changes. If you've got any questions about the bylaw changes, please, please see me or one of the board members so that we can explain um, and answer your questions um, before we get to the um, congregational meeting. Um, we're going to have limited time um, to move through all of those changes, and we really want people to come to the meeting as prepared as they are um, for that meeting. A couple of other things, um, just a reminder, um, after our closing song, we'll have snacks downstairs in Fellowship Hall, as well as um, the Easter egg hunt out in the courtyard um, for all of the children. So just head out to the courtyard um, or go through the front doors and around the corner, and you'll find um, your way to our social hall, where we have lots of cakes and goodies and coffee and things to, um, to, to munch on so that we may be community, not just in and at church, but after church as well. 
Um, second um, note is that you may see an individual running around with a camera. Um, it's a very small camera. Um, there's a documentary that's being put together. Um, it is featuring seven different individuals, including a member of the congregation, Ben. Ben, please raise your hand. Um, <laughs> They are very focused on Ben, and so Ben is going to be serving um, communion later on. Um, even if you're at Ben's station, um, they're only going to be focused on Ben, not on anybody. Um, so, um, so they are really focused um, and not going to be capturing anybody. If you're not comfortable, um, we do have the self-serve station or go to a station other than Ben, and you'll definitely not get caught on camera for that. The documentary is really amazing. Um, it is featuring and highlighting seven individuals, all who are seeking asylum because of their LGBTQ status here in the US. Um, this is a very timely video, um, very timely documentary. It's a very important message. Um, there are 75 countries right now where people can be arrested, and there are over a dozen countries where people can be executed because of their sexual orientation. There are a number of countries where individuals who associate in any way with people who identify as LGBTQ can be killed or punished or put to jail. When I was the executive pastor at MCC Toronto, um, I oversaw the refugee ministry over there, and every year we did letters of support for nearly a thousand different individuals seeking refuge in Canada. In Canada. I wish our country here in the United States were as supportive so that we could have similar programs so that all may know the love and the safety of this nation and the country and the love of our living God. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for being a witness to that powerful message. We ask that you give so that we may have the resources so that we can keep this hope alive and that resurrection can be made real. And so as the plates come forward, we do ask that you give as God is blessing you and give as you are able. Thank you.
long way to express our tremendous love for you and our commitment to your ministry here on earth, to being those expressions of Jesus that we have been called to be in this world at this time. So take these gifts and like the loaves and the fishes, just multiply them and distribute them to all those who need to hear that message. Amen. Amen. And on this Easter Sunday, I invite you to join me in prayer. It's Easter, God. And as we think about the resurrection and we listen to the message from our pastor this morning, we can't help but reflect about, reflect on those things that seem deader than a doornail and impossible of being resurrected. I mean, we look at our country and we have to just trust that what's taking place is a necessary death and that something better will come out of it. And then we look at our church and we find the same pattern going on within our denomination as well. And so God, we just ask that you would give us the courage and the strength and the faith to trust this process, to allow what needs to die to die, to salute it if it served us, to happily send it away if it didn't, and then to look forward to whatever is new, even if it shows up in forms and in ways that we didn't expect, we didn't imagine, perhaps we didn't even want. And finally, God, with our own lives, each of us here, no matter how well off or how needy, we too have things that we just need to let die. Those things that separate us from being ever closer to you, to trusting you more, to stepping more fully into being those expressions of Jesus, those unique embodiments of Jesus that you've called each of us to be. And so, God, we ask that you just give us the strength to let those things die, too, and to step more fully into being who you want us to be, to be able to see ourselves and see the world and see each other the way that you do, so that when those whose lives are destined to cross with ours look into our face, what they see is a reflection of their own true divine nature. So, God, bless us. And as always, we offer this prayer to you with great gratitude and humility. And we do remember our friend and teacher and our resurrected Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. There's a script, but I don't need it. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> because Jesus Christ got up. He's not on that cross. He's running around out there in our spirits, and he's here today. If you ever wonder why, why do we have communion on a Sunday when we know that he got up and he rose? Because if you didn't just see it in the baptism of the children today, yeah. the journey continues, the story again, because there's another resurrection to come. So in between time, we continue that story, we celebrate, we offer those rituals, those sacraments that you and I have experienced. But we never do it the same because the same people are never in the room. The same people are never in the room. You see, Mary and the children had the overflow when the 12 disciples were in the upper room, but they got the message, they got the story. You and I are really the overflow, and we're gonna keep it going. And so here we sit in this room and we experience the presence of a living God. Just as Jesus was with his friends, Jesus is with us, and he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he simply said, and he said again today, take and eat. This is my body. This truly is the living body, the spirit of God, the spirit of Jesus Christ in this bread. So take and eat, remember me. In a like manner, Jesus took a cup. Then it was wine, today it is grape juice. And he blessed it. And really what's happening today, this is a new covenant between you and I, that we experience that risen Christ spirits, that we again agree to take it with us. We can even share that living presence with a neighbor next to you. But whatever it is we do as we drink of this, he simply said, what? Remember me. 
You see, because as often as you and I eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we acknowledge that Christ is risen. What? Christ is risen indeed. Pray with me. Loving God, holy friend, thank you for the risen Christ that you are not only yesterday, today, and will always be. Strengthen us, encourage us. Let this first meal of this Resurrection Sunday encourage us to continue to move forward, to be open to your leading, so that as we transform from being helpers to being leaders, bringing more to Jesus Christ today, being that 67th chapter in the Bible. We bless these, animal, these, these elements in the name of Jesus, the living Christ. Amen. Amen. In order to prepare for the serving of this feast, I now ask that the ushers and the acolytes and the servers please come forward. And those of you who are guests today, we want you to know that here at Founders MCC, as well as at MCCs all around the world, we celebrate an open communion. That means you don't have to be a member of this church, and you don't have to be a member of any other church to receive communion here. You will not be turned away. All are welcome, just as you are. In just a few moments, the ushers will guide you to come forward for this communion. Again, all are welcome.
Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. I feel the spirit of resurrection. And as you head out into the world, may you too take that feeling in that spirit of resurrection with you. May you remember that wherever you are on your journey, whenever you feel like life has brought you to a dead end or an empty tomb, may you know that God is there with you. That God is there calling you out, leading you into a life made new. That you have everything that you need. That God's love is there within you. May you be the power of the resurrection. May you share the story of hope. That not only you, but us and strangers in this world know that there is a God who loves them. Just the way they are, wherever they may be found on this journey. Go forth and be the hope of the resurrection. Right. Amen? Amen. Let us rise and sing our closing song. Thank you for joining us today. By participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry. Wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. Please connect with us and interact with us by telephone, email, or social media. Be an angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donation link. 
With your help, we expand and reach a greater number of people with God's love through this ministry. We invite you to write to us so we can be in prayer and praise with you. You are a part of Founders Metropolitan Community Church. Email us directly, info at mccla.org. May God bless you.